Good morning. I will be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Good morning to you all. Good to see you. It looks like we have several visitors that are with us. I'd like to remind you to fill out one of those cards in the pew that's in front of you and to make sure that you leave it either there in the pew, uh, in your seat, or put it in the contribution box so that we can have record of your attendance. We're thankful that you have come our way. We have an exciting couple of weeks coming up with the youth. We have Flint Hills Camp coming up this week, and so the youth will be out in Sedan, and then the following week we have Silver Maple, and so exciting times for our youth. Is it easy for you to keep things in perspective? Perspective is the capacity to view things in their true relations or relative importance. How good are you at keeping your priorities straight? Some of us have tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is the constriction of the visual field resulting in the loss of the peripheral vision. An extreme narrowness of viewpoint, narrow-mindedness maybe, single-minded concentration on the one objective. We know also peripheral is that of relating to or being the outer part of the field of vision. And so we're just going to do a little test here. If you would take your hands, put them out in front of you like this, your fingers, and then move them back into the outside until you can't see them anymore. That is your peripheral vision, right? And then tunnel vision, if you take one hand, put it like this over your eye, and then put the other one over your eye like that. Hold on, I'm going to get a picture. No. <laughs> Say ahoy, matey. Which one of those describes your life? Do you have a full range of view with the peripheral vision, or is your life kind of like this, tunnel vision? We're going to talk about three characters within the Bible this morning. The first one is an aggressive, miserly businessman. The second one is a young man up and coming to power. And the third one is a long-suffering wife. Let's turn to the book of 1 Samuel. All three of these are going to be within the same, the same uh, story. But if I gave you those three, a, a miserly businessman, a young man rising to power, and then a long-suffering wife, what would you guess? In our hurry-up world, we can sometimes not focus upon the things that we need to, or we can get so focused upon the details that we lose sight of the bigger picture. This miserly man, as we're going to look at today, is one who is so focused upon the bottom line that he forgets to be neighborly, and then he pays a dear price for that. This young man who is rising to power, lose sight as to whom he belongs to, and he almost creates a, a great trouble for him. The long-suffering wife is the only character out of the three who has true perspective within this, who doesn't get tunneled vision and is able to see the entire picture, and by that saves this young man who is up and rising to power from creating some great misdeed. The story is of Nabal and of Abigail and of David, beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse 1. Then Samuel died, and all of Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at his house in Ramah. And David set out, and he went to the wilderness of Paran. Now, there was a man in Moan whose business was in Carmel, and that man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about that while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel, now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail, and the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings, and he was a Calebite. That David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go to Mount Carmel and visit Nabal, and greet him in my name, and this is what you shall say. Have a long life, peace to you, and peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now then, I've heard that you have shearers. Now, your shepherds have been with us, 
and we have not harmed them, nor has anything of theirs gone missing all the days that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at your hand to, to your servants and to your son David. Harvest time. This is a time of joyous occasion for Nabal. I mean, he is a businessman. How many sheep did it say that he had? 3,000 sheep. He had 1,000 rams. Uh, he is a rich man uh, located there with his pasture uh, near Mount Carmel. David, meanwhile, has been anointed to become king, but he has not yet ascended to the throne. He is on the run from King Saul, he has to flee for his life with that conflict. We know that there are occasions where he has the opportunity to kill Saul and he won't raise a hand against the Lord's anointed. And so he is out in hiding and he happens to be within the same area as Nabal and his sheep. And he has, David does, 600 fighting men with him. That's quite a formidable foe if he chose to be to anyone within the neighborhood, but David has not chose to be the aggressor. And in fact, during that time that he has been with Nabal's servants and with his flocks, not only has not a, a single one of their flock gone missing, but the servant says he has been a wall that's around us here in just a little bit. And now it's harvest time and David sends these, this emissary of 10 young men and says, peace be to you, peace be to your household. We hear that you're shearing sheep. We would like to join in the festivities. Give the young men what you see fit. Now, what we're going to find out a little later is basically all it takes is five lambs, some bread, and some fruit in order to appease David. It's not like he is asking for a great sum. This is not some sort of extortion money. All he is asking is for some consideration. He is the one that's out on the lamb and he's having to be there on his own and he needs to feed his men and they have rendered a service to Nabal and it's a reasonable request. He just says, let us share in your harvest and in your festivities. Remember how he addressed it. Well, how did David speak to him? He says, your servant, your son, David, listen now how Nabal responds to David. And when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal in accordance with all of the words in David's name. And then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servants and he said, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. What has he just called David? He's just called him a runaway slave. Now, he knows who David is. He is the one, notice, who brought up David's genealogy, the son of Jesse. He knows exactly who David is. And we know because of what Abigail is going to say a little bit later that David I know that you are rising to power, Abigail says. We know that you someday will be king. So we can assume Nabal also knows someday this young man is going to be king. And yet, what does he do? He flaunts his wealth and he tries to put David in his place. He says, he's just a runaway slave. I don't need to listen to him. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to those men whose origin I don't know. Do you hear all those personal pronouns within that? Oh, Nabal, he can sing one note, can he? Me, 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 me. I mean, are you expect me to take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers? He doesn't want to share, does he? He's not thinking clearly. But nonetheless, he has rejected David's attempt to be peaceful. Verse 12. So David's young men made their way back and they returned and they came and they informed him in accordance with all of these words. Now how do you feel with David? Because you do have 600 fighting men that are there. You will soon be king. You have rendered a service unto him and you have indignation towards Nabal, to say the least. Verse 13, and then David said to his men, each of you strap on his sword. So each man strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went behind David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. And so here comes David. It's not a party now. 
Now it's a war, and with 400 men, he is coming to Nabal's camp, and with the intention of destroying them all. Not a single male is going to be remaining alive once David is done here. Peripheral vision? Oh, no. What does David have? He's got tunnel vision right now, doesn't he? What is David seeing? David is seeing my pride, my ego has been hurt, and I'm going to rectify this situation. I'm going to be king someday, and I'm going to start today, and he is marching to Nabal's house to take care of business. But that long-suffering wife comes into the picture. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he spoke to them in anger. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not harmed, nor did anything go missing as long as they went with them while we were in the fields. And they were a wall to us, both by day and by night, and, and all the time that we were tending the sheep. Now then, be aware and consider that you sh what you should do, because harm is plotted against our master and against his household, and he is such a worthless man that nobody can speak to him. Who is this young servant? He evidently was one of those ones that was out shepherding within the field. Has David made a valid claim to Nabal? Yes, this servant says he has been with us. Do you know what this servant has recognized? He has been out there and he has seen the power of David's forces. And in fact, the presence of them while they were out with him was like a wall that was around them. And he is saying to Abigail, you have got to do something. And in a hurry, otherwise we are dead ducks. David is coming and no one can speak to Nabal, your husband, because he's an ill-natured fellow and he won't listen to reason. And Abigail, though, the long-suffering wife, then takes it upon herself to become the emissary, beginning in verse 18. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread and two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and 100 cakes of raisins and 200 cakes of figs, and she loaded them on the donkey. And then she said to her young men, Go ahead of me. Behold, I'm coming after you. But So she, she's taken all of this stuff. And she is sending it out ahead of her five dressed lambs already, already with bread and with the fruit and with the raisins. And she's sending that ahead. She says, I'm following behind. But it, she did not tell her husband, Nabal. And it came to pass. And as it happened, as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain, that behold, David and his men were coming towards her. And she met them. Now David said, had said, it certainly... For nothing that I have guarded everything that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing has gone missing all that has belonged to him, for he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more so if by morning I leave alive as much as one male of anyone that is belonging to him. So, what's the spirit of David? David has a spirit of vengeance. All he can see is my pride has been hurt, my vision of the future has not been upheld and I am going to destroy Nabal for this and I'm going to make an example out of him. And there are murderous intentions within his heart. Abigail meets him after sending these gifts ahead and immediately she falls on her face. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and she fell on her face in front of David and she bowed herself to the ground and she fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord be the blame. And please let your servant speak to you and listen to the words of your slave. Do you hear that? Over and over what she is saying here. My servant, your slave, please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as his name is, so he is. Nabal is his name and stupidity is with him. But I, your slave, do not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Here, I... What was it that uh, Nabal was saying? What was it now that she is addressing? And how is she addressing David? It was with Nabal, who is Jesse, who is David. With Abigail, she is saying, your servant, my Lord, my Lord. And David is just another slave that's run away with, with Nabal. What's Abigail saying? 
as she prays, as she falls down, excuse me, on her face before David? Is she simply trying to save her own life? You might think that. Is she simply trying to protect those things that are of Nabal's household? Because if he suffers a loss, then she suffers a loss. But just listen as, as she broadens things out here, I think she has something more within the forefront of her mind. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, excuse me, I think that that's me and my phone that's making the noise up here. Since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then may your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be like Nabal. And now let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany you. What does she say to David? She is saying, David, you don't want to do this evil thing. What's, David doesn't think anything is evil here. He is filled with righteous indignation, isn't he? He is on a war path to put Nabal within his place and yet... Here is Abigail saying, you don't want to do this. You're going to shed innocent blood. Look at verse 28. Please forgive the offense of your slave, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because the Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in all of your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as the hollow of the sling. And when the Lord does for my Lord in accordance with all the good that he has spoken concerning you and appoints you as a ruler over Israel, this will not become an obstacle to you or trouble your heart, my Lord, both by having shed innocent blood without cause and by my Lord's having avenged himself. Whenever the Lord deals well with my Lord, then remember your slave. What has Abigail done? She says, David, what are you thinking? She says, remember whose you are. She says, I know those prophecies that are concerning you. I know the plans that God has for you. I know that someday that you are going to be king. Well, that's what's upset at him with, with Nabal is that he hasn't honored David as being the future prospective king. But here is Abigail laying at his feet and says, I know someday you're going to rise to power and you don't want this black mark to be upon your record. I know that you serve the Lord, that you don't serve yourself. I know, David, that you keep things in perspective, that you are a man of honor, and you always have been a man of honor. And remember that, David, that you do not want to shed innocent blood, that you are a man of honor. What is Abigail doing for David? Because she has brought down condemnation upon herself. She started that off by saying, if anyone is to be killed, Kill me first. If you want anybody to take the blame, what kind of woman is she? Well, we know that she's a, a good-sensed woman, isn't she? She is a woman of discretion, but it also said that she was a very beautiful woman. And so David isn't able to just set her aside for those reasons. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent to you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment. And blessed be you who have kept me from this day bloodshed and from having avenged myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, then certainly there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. What did, what did David do? He opens his eyes. Because of Abigail's discretion, because of her ability to put things for David within its proper perspective, this man of God returns to God and David says, I am so thankful that you have intervened. What does that tell you about David? David was a man of humility. Here he has 400 fighting men. He himself has his sword on, all of them with swords adorned and ready to go and to destroy. And yet this one woman is able to come and speak to him. Could not have David had said to her, get, get away from me, woman. I've got work to do. I'll be back to deal with you later. But no, he humbles himself. He swallows his pride. And he says, oh, bless the Lord, you woman of discretion. I, 
I thank the Lord that you have stopped me and made me think today. Now, Nabal, he is just a churlish man. He's a foolish man. He's an evil man, a vulgar man, a selfish man. He doesn't care about anybody but himself, and he is not able to be appeased by the counsel of even a faithful servant or even his wife, a man really of no power, no prominence, of no stature, but he thinks he has all of them. And here is David, a man of prominence who is rising to power, soon, someday, will be king, and he is able to take the advice of an individual woman, the wife of another man, because whenever God speaks, David is a man of God. And even if it is through the mouth of a woman, he is going to listen, and he removes the blinders, and he focuses on the big picture, and he blesses her for having come. And so David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you, and I have granted your request. Abigail goes home. Nabal's no, no the less uh, uh, knows what's going on with all of it, but she has saved her household, saved her husband. Now just think about this for a minute. Did Abigail really have to get involved in all of this? Abigail could have gotten on her donkey and ran for the hills, couldn't she have? As soon as that she received that message from the servant, she could have grabbed her kiddos or her belongings, whatever, and said, oh, hallelujah, I'm going to be a, a widow by evening. Couldn't she? She knew what was about to happen, and what she done? She has sealed her fate for the rest of her life? To a man like Nabal? Who would put their life on the line for a man like Nabal? But the Lord is not through with Nabal. Look at verse 36. Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was having feast in his house like the feast of the king. And Nabal's heart was cheerful within him, and he was very drunk. And so he did not, she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But in the morning, whenever the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him so that he became like stone. And about ten days later... The Lord struck Nabal dead. Why did God do that? There was a lesson to be learned to prove a point that whenever you walk with God, then you are blessed. But whenever you walk outside of God's counsel and outside of God's love and kindness towards your neighbor then, and stranger, then you set yourself up. For punishment. It's kind of like the rich young farmer that Jesus spoke about. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And what was it that Jesus had said to him? He says, you fool or you Nabal. The same thing, right? You fool. This very night your soul is demanded of you. And as for that which you have prepared, who will own it now? What profit is it if I gain the whole world and I lose my own soul? Nabal, he couldn't see. Only thing that he could see was his miserly goods. Not anybody else's needs. Not even his wife's. N Nabal might have been able to turn to his wife, Abigail, and say, oh, thank you so much for saving our lives. Let's get another lamb or two or three over to David. But instead, it says he just turns to stone, sulking. And then the Lord demands his life of him. A fool to the end. What happens to Abigail? When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of the shame inflicted on me by the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. And whenever the servants of David came to Abigail at Mount Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David has sent us to take you to him as his wife. And she got up and she bowed her face to the ground and she said, Behold, your slave is a servant to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. And then Abigail got up quickly and rode on the donkey with her five female attendants who accompanied her and she followed the messengers of David and she became his wife. Abigail, a woman of discretion, beautiful not only on the outside but on the inside as well, but most importantly, she was a woman of God. She was able to keep those things that were going on, all the things that were going on within her life, and keep them within proper perspective. She was married to a foolish man, a churlish man, wife of somebody who you might just 
want to get rid of, and yet she stood beside him. She honored him. She was faithful to him, and she even tried to save his life. David, a man of God, caught up in the moment, allowed his temper to get the best of him, ready to shed innocent blood, but relenting and repenting because of the wisdom of Abigail. Each of us has the possibility of getting tunnel vision within our life. And that's why we began with the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's close with that. Because Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying unto the Corinthians and thereby to us, there is something more important in life than your pride. There is something more important in life than your wealth and your riches. There is something more important in life than simply your comfort than we just described, Nabal, David, and Abigail. There is something more important. And what is it? For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for he, him who died and rose on their behalf. What controls you? Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you not do those things that you shouldn't? Why did Christ die for us? It was to give us perspective. It was so that we might have our sins forgiven, to have that hope of heaven, but so that we can have our purpose, our lives focused upon what is the priority so we don't get caught up in the details of life and making money and, and and being hot-tempered over our pride and forgetting who God is and what his desire is for us. Could we at one time have walked with God and then lose sight of those things that are on their way? Absolutely, that's what David, that's what happened to him. But if we are people who are of wisdom and of discretion, not fools like Nabal, then we will remember that Christ's love controls us and the things that we do it we do because he died for us and that he rose for us and blessed be those reminders that come our way those things that take us and put our mind back into the proper perspective that remove the blinder so that we can see fully not just that small percent that is out there in front of us but so that we can say you know my comfort is of no avail my wealth is not important to me. My pride is of no concern, but it is to serve the Lord is the reason I'm here. Praise be to God for his admonition, for his reminders, and for his son, Jesus. Have you allowed yourself to become a part of his family in Christ, or have you gotten your life off-centered? Have you lost the proper perception, the perspective in life? Have you become tunnel vision after becoming a Christian and not seeing those things properly as you should? God will take those things, those ones that are servants of his and shepherds who will follow him and he will elevate them to positions of kingship. But he will take those who think themselves just as surely as what Nabal did as a king and he will relegate them to nothingness and take what they have and give it to another. If you're not yet his child, he welcomes you in to share in the blessings of the harvest. Won't you come?